a depressed man, an overweight man, and a pedophile walk into a subway. And that was just Jared Fogel. Today we're going to discuss the disgusting case of the subway guy. If you've never heard of the subway guy, then go ahead, just take my hand. Let me help you from underneath that rock and let me tell you a story that'll make you just want to crawl right back under. We're going to peel back the layers of Jared's squeaky clean public image to find pure degeneracy in his privates. I'm not sure I've been more angry researching a true crime case than learning about this subhuman. Now, get your vomit buckets ready. Because as we dive deep into Fogel's story, I found that he isn't even the worst character in his own story, in my opinion. My name is Monks, and I like Jersey Mike's better anyways. Jared Fogel was born on August 23 of 1977, and he was always considered to be a smart kid. But he kept to himself, and this would lead to him becoming a bit of a loner throughout elementary school, and it wouldn't get any better for him even going into high school. Being that he didn't make any meaningful type relationships or friends, he just remained clearly socially awkward. Now, of course, he didn't want it to be this way. It was just the way it was, and he didn't have the ability to connect okay, with the other kids, and it frustrated him. He would start to become depressed, in his own words, and this is where he developed that relationship with food. The term comfort food was made for a person like Jared because that's what he found in it. And as he found this escape, okay, from his life by eating all these delicious things, his heart desired, he just eventually just ate all the time. And it was a vicious cycle of eating because it was to feel good. But then he gained weight and a new thing to feel bad about. Now, by the end of eighth grade, 13 year old Jared was literally the heaviest person in school, and that's taking into consideration the adults, the staff, the faculty. Now, unfortunately, this made him the target of bullies, which just added to Jared being utterly miserable and turning to food again for solace. Now he was weighing in at about 200 pounds going into high school, and uh, that weight would keep on stacking. Okay, as each school year passed, always alone during lunch. And there were students that were interviewed that would say that they felt bad for Jared, seeing him eat there just by himself. But to actually interact with Jared was considered social suicide. And that's very important to teenagers. So Jared just remained that pariah. So the pattern continued. And Jared sat and munched on the only friends that didn't judge him. He would eventually hit 250 pounds, and then 275 pounds. And by graduation, he was a whopping all of 300 pounds, standing at 6 feet 2 inches tall. He was a very big fellow, morbidly obese by any standards. And after high school, Everyone went off to seek their own adventures in life, right? So nobody's going to keep in mind that fat kid in school. So Jared exited everybody's consciousness. And then, in 1999, the Indiana Daily would print a story in their paper titled, From Thick to Thin. Now, nobody recognized him at first, considering he had lost 245 pounds. He had lost an entire another human being. But soon, people would just keep staring at this paper in front of them and a recognition would start to occur. It was Jared Fogel. Well, the community would recognize him and heap praise for his amazing achievement. He became a local celebrity. But what happened to him next would propel him into the realm of pop culture icon. Losing 245 pounds is quite the feat itself, but... He did it in just 11 months, and the manner he did it by would create the perfect storm of success for him. He did it all by eating Subway, a small turkey sub in the afternoon and a veggie delight for dinner before anyone could say $5 foot long. Jared was in a Subway commercial sharing his incredible story. The public 
ate it up. They loved it. He looked like the average guy. He was a bit awkward on camera, but that only added to his likability. A few more commercials, and Jared Fogel was now the official spokesman for Subway. He would now find himself on the road for 200 days out of the year, traveling all across America, inspiring kids to get healthy. And in a society that was growing more and more obese each year, he was that welcomed inspiration to get healthy. The overweight outcast was now a beloved public figure. He even got himself a girlfriend, which he would eventually marry and have kids with. He, at one point, was estimated to be worth around $15 million. Everyone knew him. Everyone loved him. He inspired thousands. He had a beautiful family and a ton of money. He had it all. But on one of these trips, he would meet a woman named Rochelle Herman, a woman that would change the course of his life forever. They met to do a simple radio interview and wound up having an extremely twisted relationship for the next four years. Disturbingly, on their first meeting during this interview or after, I forget, they vibed so well that he was comfortable enough to lean into her ear and whisper, I find junior high school girls so hot. Jared would be obligated to travel the world for Subway, but he would make time to call Rochelle countless times a day to talk about his deepest, darkest, and you better believe they were fucking dark fantasies. She made him comfortable because she too was interested about these thoughts and she would listen intently while participating. And besides fantasies, he would regale her about stories of being with minors, some as young as 10, maybe nine, he doesn't really know. Jared Fogel, the face of Subway, the champion of the underdog, the inspiration for kids all across America, is a pedophile. We know all this because a multi-year long sting by the FBI was already in the works. They were tipped off by a concerned mother that would produce countless recorded phone calls of her and Jared talking about the filthiest, fucking most degenerative thing. And it almost always involved children. The concerned mother's name was none other than Rochelle Herman. The first time that Jared leaned in and whispered in her ear that he found underage girls hot it completely caught Rochelle off guard. She had to process what she just heard. And when it did process, oh, she hated Jared. She hated Jared more than any other human being that she could think of. And from that very moment on, it became her mission, her life goal to destroy him. You see, Rochelle Herman was a mother of a 10-year-old girl and 11-year-old boy both right in Jared's wheelhouse. And yes, he liked little boys too. So to make sure he doesn't hurt any more kids, she goes to the authorities and eventually becomes the undercover informant for the FBI. She began handing over tapes, recordings, hours of disturbing conversations with Jared. But unfortunately, things moved at a snail's pace and the years would just melt away. But her commitment and involvement will definitely pay off. Although, she still had to endure those disgusting conversations with Jared for four years. And he would call her every single day, multiple times a day. She recalled him calling her 15 times in one day just to talk about his sick fantasies. That's what she had to endure. And she would say that this would give her nightmares, even today. She has PTSD because of this. And the most disturbing thing of all, these conversations, which will highlight how fucked up Jared is, was when he asked Rochelle, would you do anything for me? Of course, she's playing her role, and she would say yes. You know, she's already working for the FBI. She doesn't want to give anything away or lose this 
creep. After she says yes, he would then ask her about her children and if he could see them naked. The monster had her fucking children in his crosshair. So we all know that you could mess with mama and you might come out alive. But if you mess with her cubs, oh, she's going for the throat. Rochelle would never let up now until this useless piece of shit was gone. The Jared Foundation. Now, this was a foundation created by Jared, which supposedly sought to provide education and events for schools to open dialogue about healthy eating and exercise. Now, at the helm of this foundation was a man named Russell Taylor. And I don't know how Jared did it, but he was able to find another human being just as disgusting as he is. And in my opinion, I happen to think Russell Taylor is even more of a degenerate than even Jared was. Russell Taylor was working for the American Heart Association when he and Jared crossed paths at a community event where Jared was the primary speaker. Now, turns out he heard what Jared had to say, he wasn't too impressed, and he offered to help Jared fine tune his speech. And surprisingly, he did. And Jared was thoroughly impressed, okay? And they became fast friends. Now, Russell Taylor was the man that we could all assume Jared wanted to be, a smooth-talking playboy of sorts, okay? He possessed all the social attributes that Jared didn't naturally have. But in all reality, Russell was more of a con man with very little scruples, very little, if Zero scruples, okay? If it meant making money. He pretty much talked his way into Jared's good graces. And not long after, the two became even closer and started even traveling together. And before you know it, Russell Taylor was in charge of Jared's foundation. He was probably the worst candidate to run a lemonade stand, let alone an entire charitable foundation. But Russell had some qualities that Jared really appreciated. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is Angela Taylor. This is Russell's wife. Now Angela has two young daughters from a previous marriage. One is 10 and the other is 13. And they all lived happily in a nice house, in a nice neighborhood. The suburbs, the finer things in life. Now these are all things that Angela and her daughters were not used to until Russell came into the picture. Now remember how I said, <clears throat> that you could sometimes mess with mama and you might come out alive. Just don't mess with her kids, right? Well, Angela over here somehow didn't get the memo. She wasn't necessarily built the same as most loving, caring mothers. And I suggest you guys turn up your lights a little bit because it's about to get really dark. Before Angela and her daughters moved into the house, Russell had installed cameras everywhere. Every imaginable place that would be inappropriate, he would place a camera. There was a camera in a cuckoo clock. The girls' bedrooms definitely had a camera, even their bathrooms. Anything the girls did in the privacy of their room or the privacy of anywhere, their creepy stepdad was watching and recording. He would even do it in public, in the guise that he wanted to be a filmmaker, making a documentary about his 10-year-old stepdaughter and her girl's baseball team, Angela. Their mother, their designated protector, knew all about it. Russell had even expressed his desire to Angela that he wanted to have sex with her daughters. Where was the motherly instinct to just grab a knife and stab them in the throat? There wasn't any. As a matter of fact, she was into it. She wanted to be a part of it. She tried to get her daughters into situations where this could actually happen, introducing alcohol, weed, to a 10 and a 13 year old. Angela just wanted Russell to have what he wanted. He was the breadwinner. He gave her things that she's never had before, the finer things, and she wasn't about to give that up, but she was willing to give up her only daughters 
hard to it, broken brain. You, you try hard enough to think about this, you get broken brain. Now, I'm going to give you one more extremely disturbing example. So the 13-year-old was at school, and she comes home. She goes into her bedroom, and she sees that there's a gift on her bed. It was a dildo with a note that told her to enjoy. And she could see that it was from her stepdad, and she was horrified now back to all those cameras that russell had installed in the house this would actually play a significant role in why jared liked him so much because russell was sharing with his boss videos and images of his stepdaughters masturbating taking showers sometimes they were with boys Jared and Russell, a match made by the devil himself, traveling around the country, two of the most sick people, going to your child's school to give speeches about being a better person. Now that's nightmare fuel type shit. If you're a parent, I am a parent. Imagine being the countless parents that actually went through this, pushing their kids to give a child predator a hug. That... And all the while, Rochelle Herman, bless her, was doing the Lord's work. She had to endure Jared's vomit-inducing talks every single day, and she literally had to throw up after some of the conversations that she had with him. And the FBI would tell her, you know, these recorded conversations are all fine and dandy, and they will have their role in taking down Jared, but still... They needed him to actually slip up in real life, in 4K. So a plan was set in motion, but Rochelle had to do the unthinkable. She had to offer up one of her children to the demon. She told Jared that her son's birthday was coming up and she'd love it if he could take some time off his busy schedule and come by. She would also have to insinuate that her children were his for the taking while he was there. And he just couldn't leave it alone. Give the man an inch and he'll take a foot long, right? He would ask if her children had friends that would probably be down for sex with a fucking grown ass 30 year old man whatever age he was at the time and so rochelle most likely trying not to throw up during this particular conversation says sure that kids these days oh man they know so much about sex already jared was truly elated and said that he'll fly in and this fucker is just unbelievable he's Busy motivating people all across the land, but willing to clear his schedule with the promise of a child, of children. He booked his tickets to Sarasota, Florida, where Rochelle and her kids lived, and the plan was set in motion. Now, I wish I could just snap a fucking finger like Thanos. Every fucking pedophile blown into smithereens. I don't even want to see particles. I just want them to disintegrate. Everything was set. Rochelle's heart was racing because finally this long nightmare would end and hopefully she could make up to her children the time that she had sacrificed to bring down this monster. This FBI sting, it was to prove Jared's intent that he was willing to cross state lines in order to have these sexual encounters with children and this would automatically propel this into a federal case, a federal charge. The problem was that... The devil was still controlling the details. When Jared's schedule changed almost at the last minute and he could no longer make it that particular day, the sting operation fell apart. Everyone involved in the case were crushed and the level of disappointment Rochelle must have felt, I assume, could only be described as heartbreaking. 
So the horrible conversations with Jared would have to continue, and this was already affecting Rochelle's personal life, and now it was starting to affect her mental stability, the way that she handled things. Now, her kids were not allowed to know any of this, okay? The FBI forbade that, and to them, without this context, it would just appear to them that their mother was growing more and more distant. Their once bubbly mother was now rather flat. She'd pretty much leave whatever it is they were doing. Maybe it was a fun board game. Maybe they were just playing a simple game of checkers. She would get up when the phone rang and it was Jared. She would become private. She would go into a room and just have her conversations there, leaving her kids pretty much abandoned there. And tell me if that would affect how your kids perceive you if that was happening all the time. And then came the horrifying night that almost put her in a psychiatric hospital. And that was when he told her to give him pictures of her kids in compromising positions. The following day, she showed up to work at the radio show disheveled, no makeup, looking and behaving in a manner that co-workers would describe as frantic. Rochelle had thoughts in her head that Jared, being the rich and powerful man that he was, he would have connections. And those connections would be used to kill her or hurt her kids if she didn't produce those pictures. Now, of course, Rochelle would never produce such images for that creep. And this would annoy him. And they would eventually lose contact. But her lips were still to remain sealed about this case until it came to, I guess, fruition. And she would continue to lose sleep knowing that an active pedophile remained free, not only would this haunt her nights, but her television screens as well. Because at this point in Jared's life, he had made onwards of 300 commercials and now had amassed a net worth of $15 million. Now, Let's all take a quick intermission. Go ahead and go pee, go vomit, whatever. I just want to give a quick shout out to my Patreons. I left you guys a gift. Go log into your Patreon account. It's another video. It's the worst case I've ever heard of from Japan. It happened in 1988. And if this case doesn't gross you out enough and you need more, it's there for you. Then, in 2015... The first domino would fall for Jared's empire. Russell Taylor, the executive director of the Jared Foundation, had been arrested. Angela called her girls while they were in school to tell them that their stepdad had been arrested, but she would not tell them why he was arrested. She just told them to go ahead, search Google, put his name in, to say they were shocked when they Googled Russell Taylor is an understatement. He was arrested for possessing a hard drive with over 500 images of CP. He had been grooming, luring, and forcing underage girls to produce this CP. Now, to say that the girls were horrified to learn the next part would be the understatement of the century amongst the 500 images and videos were countless ones of themselves in all sorts of embarrassing private situations. So, how did investigators even catch wind of what Russell was up to? Because in all outward appearances, he was just a regular family man with no criminal record. Well, the CP wasn't what was flagged. In Indiana, where the Taylors lived, where Fogel lived as well, there's no law against having images and videos depicting bestiality. But there is one against the actual act of it. So, the warrant that was exercised that day was for the act of bestiality. It had been flagged through electronic communications, whether text or email. And those communications were originating from Russell Taylor's computer. Upon searching his computer, that's when they found the images that they were looking for. And it was an adult woman performing a sexual act on an animal. The woman was Angie Taylor. 
his own wife. But really, who gives a shit about these two subhuman creatures? It's the daughters that our hearts are going out to. Even though they had to go through this disastrous situation, life-altering situation, hopefully they found a way to cope with it all. You know, hopefully they found peace, forgiveness, and are able to detach themselves and live their own beautiful story. And now going back to the raid, the look for bestiality material, that's when they would inadvertently find all that CP and all those fucking hidden cameras around the house. Now the next victim of Russell and Angie's depravity, I would say would have to be the detectives that had to go through those gigabytes of videos and photos and one detective would say that he still hasn't recovered from going through all those files and he would say something that was so sad he would say that the worst things about going through all that material all that cp were all the children crying they would also learn another intriguing fact about mr taylor that he worked for the subway guy, Jared Fogel. Both Jared Fogel and Subway rushed to get ahead of the story and released statements. Jared to distance himself from Russell and Subway to distance himself from the Jared Foundation. Now, Jared Fogel would tell the media, I was shocked to learn of the disturbing allegations against Mr. Taylor. Effective immediately, the Jared Foundation is severing all ties with Mr. Taylor. The statement that Subway would give, we don't have any affiliation with the foundation and we were disgusted to hear about these claims. We're glad that Jared took quick action to sever all ties with Mr. Taylor. And then the second domino would fall for Jared. 12 children were identified as victims of Russell. Then, one naked image of a child was sent by Russell Taylor to his boss, Jared Fogel. Under intense interrogation, Taylor would reveal the nature of their working relationship. The child in the picture was an actual victim of Fogel. The child was provided for Jared. He took that child to dinner and whatever happened that night, we're not going to talk about or think about any further. Another link that detectives were able to find was that Jared had purchased the house that the Taylors were living in solely for the purpose of Russell to create that CP for him. Well, that's what Russell claimed. It was true that the house was in Fogel's name, but this wouldn't absolve the Taylors in any way of their own deviance, of course. Russell Taylor had given up the ghosts, as they would say he had given up. He was just laying everything out there for detectives about his relationship with Jared Fogel, and a crucial bit of intel would be that he had handed Jared a thumb drive on one occasion, and on another occasion gave him an entire laptop, both filled with CP. This gave detectives enough evidence and probable cause to get a warrant and finally make their move on Jared Fogel. Zionsville, Indiana, on July 7th of 2015 at 5 a.m. in the morning. All of Jared's dominoes came crashing down. The FBI burst into his house when he least expected it and started gathering every bit of hardware, any potential evidence, hoping that the early raid would catch the media sleeping. They just didn't want any press, but they were disappointed. Of course, somebody leaked it, as they always do. When they looked outside, there was already a media circus forming. The reporters were recording everything. They captured the police exiting the house with hard drives and computers. They even recorded Jared Fogel himself walking around looking a bit distressed because at this point, Jared had not been charged or arrested with any crime as of yet. He was free to walk around as they tore up his house for the next 11 hours, but he wouldn't stick around. He would call his lawyer and the lawyer would come pick him up and sp sped him off somewhere, you know, to you know, get the story straight. And lost in the narrative sometimes was that Jared had a wife and two children. They were recorded leaving the scene during the raid. Now, they 
they are definitely victims of their husband, of their father's sins. And we can only hope that, you know, the situation didn't dampen the rest of their lives for something that they had no control over. And uh, hopefully they had a good life. And that's all we could wish, right? So... Within the USB drives, they confiscated, along with multiple cell phones, numerous computers, and other miscellaneous digital devices. Investigators had to comb through 5.6 terabytes. Fathom that. I don't even have 5.6 terabytes of, of me fucking up this video. So they were able to link text messages back to Russell Taylor and to that of Rochelle Herman, corroborating their stories. As the FBI kept digging, scrutinizing the finances and trying to create a timeline of his movements, they were able to piece together Jared's abhorrent behavior. During his travels around the country for Subway in the course of 15 fucking years, from 2000 to 2015, he was spent on average $12,000 per year on sex workers. But that wasn't his real preference, as we already know. For a little extra, he would always solicit information about underaged prostitutes. And it's extremely disturbing to know that he had some favorite spots in some major cities. Okay, he found plugs for his depravity, such as Las Vegas, Florida, and other big cities, but his favorite, which investigators thoroughly found a solid paper trail for, was New York, the Big Apple, specifically the Plaza Hotel just off Central Park, and also the Ritz-Carlton in Manhattan. They were able to find two minors in New York, both 16 years of age, that had been with Fogel. They now could charge him with traveling over state lines to engage in unlawful sex with a minor and victimizing prostituted minors, which escalated the charge, like I mentioned before, into a federal crime. This, along with conspiring with Russell Taylor to distribute and receive CP, they had him by his worthless balls. Jared Fogel, who a short time ago inspired and was beloved by the country, was exposed to be a pure waste of space, human garbage that should cease to even exist, castration guys, to repeated rapists, child predators, not such a bad idea when you think about it, right? Come on, lawmakers. You know you guys have the three strikes law. How about the three snips law? You do it once, ah, oh, there goes a nut. You do it twice, oops, two nuts. You do it the third time, oops, we got to cut off your cuckoo. And so by August of that same year, Jared Fogel had pled guilty to CP and 14 kids slash victims were uncovered. But there definitely had to have been more kids. I would put good money down that there were countless more victims. 15 years and he was that disgusting. He was like a sex addict, right? And there were those phone recordings that he had with Rochelle Herman that had him describing his encounters with children in Thailand, different countries, okay? He would always say that Thailand, it was so much easier for him to have access to children there than it was in America. And we must definitely show our respects to Rochelle Herman because she truly sacrificed a lot. And her recordings played a major role in bringing down Jared. She truly is the mama bear. Jared was ordered to pay $1.4 in restitutions and serve 15 years in jail. This was in 2015, so he's scheduled to be out in 2030, but when has there been a case that we've covered at least, barring death, that the criminal actually serves out his whole sentence? Now, the Subway Corporation itself would not walk away unscathed. Jared's wife, of course, filed for divorce and also filed a lawsuit against Subway. She gave a public statement about her ex-husband and Subway would catch some stray shots in the process. Finding out that your husband and the father of your children is a child predator 
and knowing that his job involved him visiting schools on a regular basis is devastating. Finding out that Subway did not act upon at least one complaint while continu continuing to utilize Jared as their spokesperson and facilitate his visits to those hundreds of schools is beyond comprehension. I filed this lawsuit today because I have questions, questions that someday my children will ask me, and that I imagine the, four the families of the 14 victims are asking, questions to which I, can, I have no other way to get answers. Questions like what did Subway know? When did they know it? What investigations did they conduct? Do they ever notify the authorities? I also filed this lawsuit because I am seeking damages from Subway. As the complaint alleges, there, uh, there have been news reports that Subway received at least one complaint of Jared's sexual interest in children. Subway even took the step of marketing him as a family man and used my children and my likeness in that campaign. I did not give them consent to do so. Now, unfortunately for her, the lawsuit was dismissed, but she was awarded $7 million in the divorce, given that Jared didn't spend all that money on underage hookers eating because he did look a little fat again. And now we come to the point in this video where I'm going to struggle to find a learning opportunity. This one was a bit difficult, and I would say this, at least it placed a healthy skepticism into the public eye, into who we trust around our children in general. I'm hoping this is the case. I mean, if a liver-lipped pedophile with creepy dead eyes, guys, if you go back and look at all those Subway commercials, look at pictures of Jared, it was, it was right there in front of us, wasn't it? If that creepy dude was able to win our hearts just because he lost some weight, then who else is next to dupe us? Jared Fogle. Russell Taylor, Angie Taylor, all horrible humans that should not even exist in the same society we're trying to raise our children in. Now, I want to put this into perspective, what money can buy, and it should piss you off. Do you recognize this picture? His name is Raymond Frolander, and he sexually abused an 11-year-old boy for God knows how long. And when the boy's father finally caught him in the act, he beat Frolander to the point of almost no return, giving us this hilarious mugshot. Okay? The dad is my fucking hero. The point here is, Frolander received 25 years, as opposed to Jared Fogel's 15 years. The only difference, Jared Fogle had a million dollar defense team. And I don't think it's even arguable that what Jared did was X amounts worse. But just to leave you guys on a lighter note, an inmate at the Federal Correctional Institution Inglewood in Colorado, where Jared was serving as well, felt the same way we do, that the sentence for his crimes were just too light. So he took it upon himself to beat the shit out of Jared, leaving him bruised and bloodied. It was all over the newspapers. I'm not going to add a foot long joke here because that would just be low hanging fruit. So I'm just going to leave it at that. My name is Monks. Now go protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you.